So we are now going to be moving on to our next session. But before we do, I'm going to remind you that we have uh, our live stream over on YouTube, which you can send the link to friends and family. I will post that in the chat. And we also have uh, our social media. So we're on Instagram at Youthathon. And please do share your highlights, talk about how amazing all of our speakers are, and let other people know, spread the words about how amazing our oceans are too. But without further ado, I'm about to introduce our next speakers. So next up, we have Gabby Tan, who is joining us with the rest of some of the rest of the Tide Turners team. So Tide Turners are a youth it led environmental education project dedicated to increasing awareness of key environmental issues and facilitating greater youth engagement and advocacy and solutions. Through their initiatives and events, they aim to inspire collaboration, learning and action while equipping young people with the knowledge and skills to encourage solutions within their local communities. So Gabby, if you're all set, then it's over to you and the Tide Turners team. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, let me just pull up our slides. Sorry, give me a minute. Okay, perfect. So, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for tuning in today from wherever you are in the world. Um, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Uh, we're so excited to be here for this session. So our group is made up of Gabby, um, Julie, Jamie, Inez, Benny, Julia, and Haley. And yeah, as mentioned in the introduction, we're all from Team Tide Turners, which is a youth-led environmental education project. Um, our session today is going to be a round of climate and ocean trivia quizzes. So if you'd like to take part um, in the quizzes part of the session, please get ready to join in at kahoot.it. And yeah, I'm going to be starting us off with a really quick presentation on the ways we depend on our ocean for climate regulation and also a few ways that climate change impacts um, our ocean. And then just why the World Ocean Day emphasis on one ocean, one climate, and one future is so, so important. Yeah, so uh, one of the main reasons why our ocean is so important um, is because it's a massive carbon sink, which means it takes in more carbon than it releases. And so since 1955, our ocean has taken in more than 93% of all excess heat um, from, our, from the greenhouse gases we've met, emitted into the atmosphere. And also over time, around 30% of all our carbon emissions are absorbed by the ocean. And most of our Earth's carbon is actually stored in ocean vegetation, coral, rocks, and shells. Yeah, so the currents in our ocean also act like a huge conveyor belt around uh, the globe. So it helps to transport warm water and precipitation from the equator towards the poles and then cold water from the poles back to the tropics. So ocean currents really are key in regulating the global climate and um, help to evenly distribute solar radiation re uh, reaching the Earth's surface. And then another reason why um, our ocean is so important when it comes to climate change is the rich biodiversity that it holds um, because that's really key to helping our ocean withstand climate shocks and changes and adapt to climate change. And yeah, it's, it's key in enabling our ocean to be the huge climate and ecological regulator that it is. And now we'll move on to a couple of reasons why, uh, I'm sorry, a couple of reasons um, how, sorry, a couple of ways that uh, climate change impacts our ocean. So one of the main ways is um, the acceleration of sea level temperature rise. Um, so as you can see, it's really, sorry, I think my Wi-Fi is lagging, but it's really um, increased since around 1940 and is about 0 0.76 degrees warmer than it was in, um, at a base level of in 1880. Um, yeah, so in addition, ocean acidification um, really has a huge impact on our ocean. It hinders the ability of corals and marine organisms to form um, their shells, and it increases the stress um, on coral reefs, which increases the likelihood of coral bleaching as well. And then, yeah, as we can see from this graph, uh, 
sea level rise is a huge issue. So overall, since 1880, the sea level has risen by eight to nine inches. And yeah, the rate of sea level rise is really accelerating. It has more than doubled from 0 0.6 inches per year throughout most of the 20th century to around 0 0.148 inches per year between 2006 and 2015. Yeah, so as scary as those um, impacts sound, recent analysis has thankfully shown that our ocean is uh, really resilient, really. Um, and we have another shot at saving it. So actually ocean-based solutions could reduce the emissions gap by 21% if we're aiming for 1.5 degrees um, and by 25% if we're aiming for two degrees. So yeah, our ocean has a huge rate of role to play in the solution to climate change. And yeah, if we take drastic action now, studies have shown that we can restore our oceans to former glory within 30 years, which is a really positive sign. And that's all for my presentation. So we're gonna move on to the quiz part. Um, so feel free to go to kahoot.it. Yeah, so the pin is 524279, and we'll just wait a couple of minutes for people to trickle in. Okay, amazing. We can go ahead and get started. Cool. Yeah, that was a tricky one. Um, so the answer to that question is that our ocean absorbs roughly around 30% of our greenhouse gas emissions um, that we emit into the atmosphere. And moving on. <laughs> Congrats, Lydia. Um, Next, we have a true and false question. So general ocean facts. Yeah, so apparently there are 228,000 known species and um, a lot of researchers think there are over 2 million that we have yet to discover. So that's very exciting. Um, moving on. Congrats again, Lydia. Um, Yeah, so um, a survey of global tropical reefs found that between 2014 and 2017, actually around three quarters of our reefs face severe heat stress, which puts them at risk for coral bleaching. Amazing. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to speed through these. So next question, is what, are the, what is the definition of ocean currents? Amazing, everyone got that right. Um, and then, oh, someone stalked Lydia off first place. This one should be an easy one. Amazing. Um, okay, we have three questions left. And moving on to our last question. Amazing. Um, congrats to our winners and our runners up. Thank you for listening. So I'm gonna, now I'm going to pass it on to, um, to Inez and Benny, who will be presenting on fishing sustainability. Hi, so I'm Inez. I'm just waiting for it. There's Benny. So, yeah, we decided to do our presentation on fishing sustainability, which is a bit more niche. Um, but we thought it was something that, you know, we could probably all be a bit more educated on. So, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. So today we're going to talk about uh, fishing sustainability and um, more specifically, I think um, we're going to have a look at how environmentally friendly is the fish industry in real life and what goes into uh, this massive, massive market. So um, I would like to start by saying, what is the fish industry? Because I'm not um, sure if everyone knows, it's, as I was saying, it's really big. And also it does not only include the actual action of fishing, but there are many other elements um, to it. Um, so if Gabby, do you wanna please change the slide? Thank you. So, the fishing industry includes any activity concerned with taking, culturing, processing, preserving, storing, transporting, marketing um, fish or fish products. 
it is divided into two uh, sections, the production and the consumption of fish. So in the production, you can you can see what's in there. It's practically everything that happens before you see your fish on your plate, you eat your sushi and so on. In terms of the consumption instead, I think this is more of an interesting um, section because people don't really realize um, that this plays a, a role in the fish industry as well. And it's apart from human consumption, you also have recreational uses for example, SeaWorld, these kind of um, themed parks uh, use fish for um, recreational uses. And then we have fish used in, as input factors to other processes. Um, what I find, find astonishing is that directly or indirectly, um, the livelihood of over 500 uh, million people uh, especially in developing countries, depends on fisheries and aquaculture. This is a um, really interesting, I think, number because um, it is important to be cautious with with what we with the fish we eat because the fish industry has massive environmental impact. But at the same time, it is really difficult to to tackle this problem because the fish industry is a main element in developing countries and it supports a lot of activities um, that otherwise wouldn't be able to exist. Um, the big question that is at the center of our presentation though is, is it, is it really sustainable? Is fishing really sustainable? And, and um, the truth is yes, I think that um, from one side it's it's natural to think that um, fish is really healthy, especially because it has omega-3 fats, um, nutrients like vitamin D, calcium. Um, there's no denying the numerous health benefits of, that eating seed food can have. But uh, on, the, um, on the other side, the effects of commercial fishing on the environment can no longer go unnoticed. And I think that to really analyze the environmental impact of, of fishing, we have to consider the different types um, of how these fishes have been uh, raised, fed, and caught. Um, in fact, not only does the fish industry remove unsustainable numbers of reproductively mature fish from their natural environments, but it also directly damages these marine habitats. One of the most detrimental uh, techniques is what is known as bottom trawling, where uh, practically an, um, fishermen drag a net along the bottom of the seabed, stirring up significant amounts of sediment. They reintroduce pollut pollutants in the food chain and damage uh, coral species, which um, provide shelter for a lot of seafood. So not only this type of culturing, there's also another one which is extremely, extremely damaging, which is blast fishing and cyanide fishing. And they are two practices where um, fishermen use explosives to kill large quantities of fish and cause the destruction, not only of the animal itself, but also to the underlying habitats, um, such as coral uh, reefs. And cyanide fishing instead, they use cyanide to kill, um, to kill the fish. And what is astonishing if we talk about human consumption terms is that we actually then eat um, the fish sprayed with cyanide. And that's, I think, um, not only really unhealthy for us, but especially for the ocean. Uh, then we have a whole lot of um, problems associated with transportation, storage and marketing, because commercially caught seafood, seafood has higher carbon emissions due to the use of refrigeration and also the amount of fuel used on fishing uh, vessels. Um, one of the examples is shellfish. They require a lot of fuel because um, fishermen have to drag uh, large dredges across the ocean floor to, to catch seafood. And that, that um, requires a lot of fuel. And then uh, we have the consumption 
part of the cycle, which also um, has a de uh, detrimental impact on, on the ocean and not only on the environment in general, because um, cons commercial consumption gives birth to overfishing and overfishing occurs when fish populations are reduced to below uh, dangerously low levels. And uh, this, results in, this results in reduced growth of biodiversity, resource de depletion, and sometimes unsustainable population sizes for many fish species. Um, this practice has then been um, linked uh, to the ruin of several ocean ecosystems, as well as reduced catches for many fishing companies that can then lead to um, eventually economic collapse of the industry. So um, the question that now comes is then what is sustainable seafood? Can we actually um, eat or enjoy sustainable seafood? Um, well, to, to determine what the sustainability of seafood, we use um, two reliable resources uh, to understand what it really is. And the first is Seafood Watch that says that sustainable seafood is determined by three key factors. If it, if it complies with environmental protection, if it um, encourages social responsibility and if fishing is done responsibly, and if it's economically viable. According to um, the Marine Stewardship Council instead, um, the state's more specific requirements that are also associated with economic concepts um, and geography. Um, it is based on three different uh, elements here as well, that um, seafood must come from sustainable fish stocks, um, it ha must have a minimized environmental impact, and it must come from fisheries that have effective uh, management. From these um, three elements, we can understand that um, buying local seafood is one of the easiest way to, to be sustainable. And before purchasing, one must ask um, themselves a lot of questions. So where is the fish from? Where, when was it harvested? How has it how has it been harvested? Um, is it farm ways? Where is the farm located, and so on? Okay, so Benny kind of just touched up on the end about um, you know the consumer's role in fish sustainability, and that's what I'll be going into more depth in. And so the first thing we have is like recognizing sustainably sustainably raised food and I think one of the first distinctions we need to make is the difference between farmed fish and like wild caught fish and there's this misconception that it, one is a lot lot better than the other so I thought maybe we could like just go through those so both of these sources of fishing have like their pros and cons and the first thing that can be done is to incorporate locally farmed or wild caught fish and that's what Benny was just touching on there saying how locally caught a locally bought fish is probably the best because you're minimizing the transportation pollution but in terms of the actual types of fishing so for example for wild caught the the biggest con so the biggest disadvantage is overfishing which Benny described in depth previously however if you are able to have like these well managed fisheries that don't release chemicals that could be a very good alternative and on the other hand, you have the aquacultured, which are these the farmed fish. And these do have cons when they're not really done efficiently and sustainably. For example, there's a lot of uh, chemical and waste contamination from those processes, the spread of disease and parasites in the open water if, fish ex uh, if the fish escape. And then there's also, it takes a lot of energy to farm big fish like tuna. So. But at the same time, it does have its advantages, like being able to be done year round and it's not limited to where the species normally lives. So that kind of puts into perspective, depending on where you live, you should probably think, which kind of fish do I go for? So aquaculture, which is farmed fish, that's ideal for like shellfish. So if you're going to get your shellfish, you might as well get it from a farmed, a sustainably farmed place. And for the other hand, for the wild caught fish, that would be for like larger fish like tuna. So in a more, this is kind of, very nitpicky in terms of what we can do when purchasing fish items. Um, and it is vital to just to look beyond generic claims about 
certain fish just stating on their lip packaging being like, oh, it's sustainable or responsible. There are specific labels that you need to look out for. So for example, there are, there are, there's quite an array. There's like the Marine Stewardship Council, which will show blue tick, the Marine Conser Conservation Society, which has like this traffic light system, which shows that, you know, this fish is green in this particular area, meaning you can, buying that fish is not like harming the, uh, like the biodiversity of the fish at that uh, particular moment in time. And there's just a whole range of these um, labels that we can look out for. And um, the Marine Conservation Society also has a website that outlines the fish that can be bought and the other species that should not be bought. And because it's online, it's easy, it's accessible. And this small change in habit before shopping can, can generate a lot of difference in terms of how we eat seafood if we eat seafood. And then for example, as well, I mean, now that we're in this digital age, there's also a seafood watch app and that can also help you with this kind of knowing which fish in your region you should be eating or should not be eating at a particular time. And, you know, the labeling system of the labeling on the fish, as Afa mentioned, it does have its flaws because, you know, the different labels make it hard to remember what means what. And, you know, we could argue that there should be one universal label and hopefully that's something that we can bring into our future. So now I'm also gonna be talking about incorporating sustainable seafood into your diet. And after hearing this presentation, many of you could be like, oh, then why should we continue eating seafood if it does have its harms? Well, seafood is one of the most climate friendly, low carbon animal proteins. So for meat eaters, stopping fish consumption would increase the demand for land-based protein sources. And this would ultimately lead to higher carbon emissions, deforestation, water shortages to you know, sustain those um, land-based protein sources. And it's also really important to know that seafood does support millions of livelihoods in their communities, as Benny had mentioned, especially in developing countries. So you can't exactly just uh, destroy a whole market for that and therefore the answer is not to stop eating seafood completely if if you're someone who eats uh, seafood and is to make this mindful purchase that will su support sustainable and responsible practices by and will also thus reduce food waste um, and then lastly we're just bringing in this what can we do as you know be students people just you know citizens it's to hold governments accountable so there are in many, many countries, there are very unfair fishing quotas. So for example, the way in which the UK government allocates fishing quotas plays a substantial role in the lack of um, sustainability of the fishing industry. So the quotas are concentrated among a few multi-million like pound companies and compared to smaller fishing operations, these big companies, not only are they worse that they worse for the environment because they tend to use less sustainable methods, but also considering this human cost, they employ fewer people. So not only does this harm the oceans, but in, in addition, less money is injected into these local economies. And so I'm aware of time, so I'm aware that we're not gonna be able to do our, um, you know, our quiz. So I'm just gonna quickly finish on, you know, what we need to tackle and what we can take part of. And that is, you know, we can, as we, we can attend protests and stuff to tackle the distribution of quotas and the fact that corporate giants are plundering oceans and we can advocate for you know the conditions for workers and the fishing practices and we could also we also should advocate for more protected protect, protected areas at sea like sea sanctuaries that are refugees for fish and other marine life but yeah so thank you and hopefully you learned a bit more about you know fishing sustainability thank you Yeah, thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. Um, sorry, in the... Okay, so since we have two more pairs to go, we're gonna move on to um, the next presentation, but we'll definitely link the Kahoot in the chat to Inez and Benny's Kahoot on fishing sustainability, so you guys can feel free to check that out. And yeah, now I'd like to pass it on to Julia and Haley for a presentation on dead zones. 
Hi everyone. Yeah, so today Julia and I will be presenting on dead zones. So we're gonna go through like what are they, how do they empower oceans, and what we can do to combat them. So um, in this presentation, we will be going through what dead zones are and where they can be found, followed by their causes and their solutions. Uh, finally, we will end on some concluding thoughts and a fun kahoot. So as uh, Julia mentioned, we'll be starting off with an introduction to dead zones. Uh, dead zones refers to waters where oxygen concentrations are below two milligrams per liter, or more recently as any coastal system experiencing any symptoms of eutrophication. Dead zones have been associated with a myriad of different issues, including loss of biodiversity and large scale fish kills, amongst other things. So where can these dead zones be found? There are currently over 700 coastal areas worldwide that are either dead zones or negatively impacted by runoff. As you can see in the map above, no part of the world is immune. Dead zones have increased dramatically during the past 50 years with dead zones being discovered along the coastlines of the United States, the Baltic States, Japan, and the Korean Peninsula. Dead zones have a host of detrimental effects on the ocean. Most notably, dead zones are lethal for most of the existing organisms in these coastal systems. Now, organisms that can swim away from these conditions do, they flee and so they avoid hypoxic waters, but this may not always be the case. Sometimes they're trapped in baymans or other areas, so uh, you, there are many cases where hypoxia events are associated with large-scale fish kills. Other organisms that can't move, such as shellfish and worms and so forth, are trapped and often suffocate and die. And even if most of the organisms do flee, dead zones also lead to other problems, um, such as affecting the habitat of fish. For example, the like, which bottling fish will also often continue to hang around the edges of the hypoxic zone, which will maintain some exposure through foraging activities. So they are exposed in and out in the hypoxic zone and just this intermittent exposure can lead to serious reproductive impairments, changes in sex and other bizarre things. All of this th then contributes to a loss of biodiversity in the long run. And finally, there is also a huge economic impact as written in the slide. Every year they inflict $3.4 billion in economic damage in Europe and the US alone due to lost tourism and fishing, declining property values, water treatment and adverse health effects. We chose a specific study to illustrate this point. The Gulf of Mexico is the second, large, second largest dead zone in the world. It spanned 2,116 square miles in 2020 and is estimated to cost USC food and tourism industries $82 million a year. There has also been an increase in the proportion of smaller sized shrimp caught in the Gulf of, Gulf of Mexico in recent years. It may be that these growth impairments of hypoxia on shrimp are at play and are causing a reduction in the growth rate. Another factor is that when hypoxia forms, fish and shrimp aggregate around the edges. They want to avoid the hypoxia, but they tend to stay around the edges because there's an accumulation of food sources there. But the fishermen know this, so they can target fish and shrimp by going around the edges where the hypoxia forms. It is also believed that some of the small shrimp are fished out and fewer are making it to larger sizes. The bottom line is that when there are large hypoxia years, this has an adverse effect on the economic profits of local fishermen. Brown shrimp is the largest commercial market in the Gulf of Mexico, so that's a significant finding. So what's causing these dead zones? It largely depends on the region. While the US, for example, suffers mostly from agricultural waste, urban wastewater is the main culprit in South America, Asia, and Africa. However, there are a few key culprits, which are agricultural urban runoff, urban wastewater runoff, and finally climate change as a whole. The reason runoff from farms and wastewater treatment plants cause dead zones is because of the excess nutrients the runoff contains. The excess nitrogen and phosphorus stimulate algal blooms. Algae depend on nutrients, and it's good from the standpoint of providing the base of the food chain in aquatic systems. When you have excess nutrients, you have excess algal growth. They can form blooms, which is called nutrient loading, and the algal blooms at some point start degrading and sinking to the bottom, and bacteria work on these algae. Um, as the algae decomposes, they consume the oxygen from the water, and that leads to low oxygen water or hypoxia. Now, you might wonder why these conditions persist. After all, the ocean is always sloshing around and mixing, right? Well, that's because water layers of different temperature, salinity and density don't like to mix. So the fresher water coming in doesn't mix well with the hypoxic water on the bottom, leading to long-lived dead zones. However, another big variable is climate change. In the open ocean, you have global warming, which is causing a greater and greater rate of the oxygenation of open ocean waters. Scientists have noted that this is mainly due to three factors. Oxygen is less soluble with higher temperatures, so less of it dissolves into the ocean. 
Marine life consumes more oxygen because higher temperatures contribute to higher metabolic rates and higher temperatures lead to more st stratification, meaning the more oxygenated surface water doesn't mix well with more hypoxic bottom water. Furthermore, climate change is also contributing to more nutrients entering our coastal waterways. Things like greater frequency of storm events and greater precipitation in certain areas leads to higher nutrient load. In addition, they will lead to greater fresh water into coastal waters, which will increase the stratification. And this leads us on to solutions. So how can these dead zones be tackled? To mitigate dead zones completely, scientists have noted that the best management strategy is to reduce nutrient loading as much as possible. However, like many of the issues facing our oceans, climate change as a whole must be also be tackled simultaneously if there is to be any significant impact. Nutrient loading can be reduced in a number of ways, including nutrient management from the start, cover crops or buffers to prevent it from reaching local waterways, and finally, a drainage water management system to reduce the number of nutrients reaching local streams. However, as normal consumers, uh, preventing nutrient loading is not something that we can easily contribute to. Therefore, it'd be more effective to simply be more environmentally conscious in our daily lives. Alongside the amazing strategies outlined by the other speakers in this youthathon, we just wanted to touch on key principles to keep in mind. So this includes being conscious of your actions, which um, may range from where you shop or what you buy, and finally how you shop. Alongside this, to act and shop ethically, be aware of greenwashing, like Benny and Ines, Ines touched on in their presentation, look at the labels on your food. And finally, use your voice. Talk to people around you about the issue. Conservation success hinges on the collaborative spirit of cities, farmers, agribusiness, and policymakers to embrace science-based solutions, both on the ground and at the policy level. Through greater awareness and collective action, we can hopefully work towards smaller dead zones, cleaner water, and healthier crops. We wanted to end um, our presentation on a success story. So um, our example that we chose was Narangan Thet Bay, which by imposing regulations on sewage treatment plants to reduce nutrient loading by 50%, the state was able to reduce hypoxia in this bay, which shows that it is possible to mitigate dead zones. And next up is just a quote from one of the a scientists who talked about dead zones in a podcast and worked on reducing the dead zone in Narangan Thet Bay. Um, we chose this particular quote because we felt that it could be applied to a lot of the issues that are spotlighted during this youthathon. Amazing. Okay, so I'm gonna pull your kahoot up. Okay, perfect. I think we can go ahead and get started. Okay, so now we can move on to our next question, I think. So how many dead zones have scientists discovered? Okay, so yeah, the answer was 700. Well done, everyone. <laughs> Most people got it right. Uh, what water oxygen concentration does the coastal system become a dead zone? Oh, good job. What is an effect of dead zones? Great job, everybody. So what are the main causes of dead zones?
again. Well done, everyone. Well done, everyone. How large was the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico? Yeah, I guess that was more of a tough question. How can the issue of dead zones be tackled? It's a very good success rate on this question. So where have dead zones uh, been reduced or mitigated? Well done, guys. Oh, congrats, whale shark. How can better management of nutrient application reduce nutrient loading? How does the planting of cover crops help reduce nutrient loading? Yeah, that was another tougher question, I think. So how does drainage management help reduce nutrients? That's to all the winners and the runners. Huh? Perfect. Thank you so much, Haley and Julia. Thank you and so much. And last but not least, we're going to pass it on to Jamie and Julie for a presentation on fast fashion. Amazing. Thank you, Gabby. Um, I'm just going to try to share my screen now. Um... Oh, Julie, you want to share it? Or Okay. <laughs> yeah, can you see that? Is that yeah. sharing? Yeah. Okay, great. So we're going to be um, discussing fast fashion and our oceans. Oh, I can't. How do I? Oh, there we go. I think it's um, swipe down. Yeah. Um, so let's start off by sort of defining what fast fashion is. It is inexpensive clothing produced rapidly by mass market retailers in response to the latest trends. So what these fast fashion brands do, do is they produce these really cheap, low quality clothing in huge volumes in order to replicate trends and bring all these inexpensive styles to the public. And what they do is they have, you know, countless new collections a year to make us feel like we are constantly out of date and thereby encouraging us to increase our consumption, to buy more, to, you know, create more ways and create more problems, um, which we will go into later. And it's thus become quite a challenge, um, you know, as a normal consumer to even wear a garment more than five times. Um, due to the declining garment quality, as well as the trends that change at a rate um, that's so quick that it demands us to keep purchasing new styles. Um, for example, uh, fashion used to run on four seasons a year, so you have fall, fall um, winter, spring, and summer. However, since the mid 2000s, um, fast fashion brands such as Zara H&M um, has actually started producing 52 micro seasons a year. So that is basically one new, one new full collection of clothes a week. And so it's you know, purposely being made to have less longevity. In order to keep the stores um, 
stocked with these latest trends, these brands also subscribe to overproduction. And each year, more than 100 billion garments are made and around 450 billion worth um, billion dollars worth of textiles are thrown away around the world. In the US, that is 11 million tons of clothing. And um, out of all these clothes, you might wonder, oh, how much of it is it, um, how much of it is being recycled? And unfortunately, it's still a very linear um, model. And thus only 1% of clothes, um, less than 1% of clothes actually gets recycled. Next slide. <clears throat> um, so these are just some examples of popular um, fast fashion brands that um, you see a lot of recently, for example, Sheen, um, H&M. Um, some of them are um, quite misleading by, they, they tend to, they, they tend to try and greenwash the products as of H&M says that they will recycle their clothes, but actually um, it's come to light that less than 30% of the clothes that does get given back to H&M in their recycling bins actually ends up getting recycled and a lot of it ends up going to landfills anyway. Next slide. So what is wrong with fast fashion? When we think of you know, the harms of fast fashion, the human rights abuses that um, happens in sweatshops internationally are usually what come to mind. However, um, the detrimental effects of this industry actually extend way beyond that. And they have a very broad environmental impact as well. So although we might not consider the production of clothes to be the most carbon intensive industry, due to the scale that is done at today, it can have actually have very huge um, impacts on things like water consumption, um, carbon emissions, water pollution and waste generation. Yeah, so to go into a bit more depth on that, um, the fast fashion industry or the fashion industry as a whole more generally um, uses huge quantities of fresh water to produce um, their clothing. So here we have a number of staggering statistics for you that really illustrate this point. And to the right, you can see um, this used to be a sea, the Aral Sea, which was the fourth largest sea in the world, um, which has now been partly revived, but in 2014 it was um, declared as being basically completely dried up. And this is, um, a large part of this is due to um, water use for irrigation, which is why, um, which the water irrigation is used for things like cotton farming. Um, so you could say that the fashion industry was in part to blame for this, because as you can see, 2,720 litres of water are, is needed for one cotton t-shirt and producing just one cotton jacket can consume over 10,000 litres of water. Producing a pair of Levi jeans uses almost 3,800 litres of water and um, uh, yeah, producing one cotton t-shirt is basically the same amount of water to sustain one human for three years. Other processes like dyeing of fabric also requires a lot of water. Uh, precisely 200 tons of fresh water is needed to dye one ton of fabric. So in total, in any one year, uh, 1.5 trillion liters of water are used by the fashion industry. This is just so exorbitant. And uh, it's clear that this is an issue, especially as we enter a hotter period of global warming and countries specializing in textile production like China and India struggle to meet their own water needs. Um, already today, while 100 million people in India do not have access to drinking water, 85% of the daily needs and water of the entire population of India could actually be solved by the water used to grow cotton in India. Uh, and worldwide, there are 750 million people who do not have ex access to drinking water. Um, yeah, so what can we actually do about this? Well, your choices as a consumer does have an impact. Your purchasing power matters because by changing the way that you shop, this puts, which we'll get into later, um, especially in the quiz, this puts pressure on um, the fashion industry in general to rethink the way they operate. Um, however, beware of greenwashing as um, Jamie brought up, brought up. So uh, to tackle this particular issue, how you can start doing this is by choosing fibers in your clothing that are less water intensive in production. Um, for example, linen and recycled fibers. And the reason why swapping to synthetic oil-based fibers are bad 
despite them using less water than cotton, for example, is because synthetic fibers are more carbon intensive instead, um, reeling a larger carbon footprint, which Jamie will get into now. Yeah, exactly. So the um, next um, problem <laughs> that fast fashion provides for oceans is um, the amount of emissions that it produces. Um, fast fashion generates a lot, a lot of emissions and this contributes to global warming and it you know, creates a whole host of problems for our oceans, such as ocean acidification, which was mentioned earlier. Um, in 2015, the production of clothing and textiles actually generated more emissions than you know, all the international flights and maritime shipping trade um, of the world combined. Um, and that's, it's purely because of the, the volume of fast fashion that has such an impact. Um, it counts for a total of 5% of total global emissions. So it's truly a sector that cannot you know, be ignored. Um, and how do these emissions arise? Um, so many synthetic materials, so for example, polyester, nylon, spandex, um, they are all very commonly used materials and using a variety of clothes in the different components of our clothes. And they use 342 million barrels of crude oil a year. And um, this crude oil in the factories in order to, in order to make the, um, uh, the microplastic fibers um, for the synthetic materials end up in, um, end up uh, requiring a lot of um, carbon footprint. Okay, so now we'll go on to fashion and water pollution. So thirdly, aside from water consumption and carbon um, emissions, fast fashion also affects our water bodies through pollution. So you have the fashion industry, which um, consumes huge volumes of fresh water and then um, produces wastewater, which um, contains toxic substances like uh, lead, mercury and arsenic. Um, and this is because chemicals are a key component during the manufacturing process of clothes. Um, they're used basically every step of the way during pest control, fiber production, dyeing, bleaching, and wet processing of each of our garments. Um, and this creates wastewater, which contains these toxic substances. And while um, the wastewater should comply with discharge regulation to avoid polluting the environment and causing irreparable damage. And there is more technology coming about now that um, can uh, adequately tackle these wastewaters and filter them better. Um, sadly, uh, most of this wastewater is just discharged directly into rivers. Um, uh, and in, in, yeah, in most of the countries in which these garments are produced. Um, the untreated toxic wastewaters are literally just dumped directly into the rivers, um, uh, which we can put a number on that. Uh, in developing countries or so-called developing countries, 90% um, of wastewater is discharged into rivers without any treatment. And these countries are usually the countries where these clothes are produced. So it goes without saying that this water pollution is extremely harmful for aquatic life and the health of residents living by those riverbanks, uh, especially those in countries that have weak environmental regulations that allow for such production in the first place. Uh, and the contamination also reaches the sea and eventually spreads around the globe. Another major source of um, water contamination is also the use of fertilizers um, for cotton production, which heavily pollutes the runoff waters. Um, and evaporation waters causing algal blooms, which I think Haley and Julia touched on a bit earlier. And now on to um, the last, oh no, yeah, the last um, of the main problems with the fashion industry. Of course, there are many more, but we can't cover everything um, in, we don't have much time left, but um, yeah. So lastly, most of the clothes we wear also releases microfibers and plastics into our oceans. Um, every time we wash a synthetic, a synthetic garment in the washing machine, about 1,900 individual microfibers are released into the water, which um, some also estimate as being even higher than that. Um, so, and these microfibers make their way into our oceans as they're too small to be filtered out by our um, current water systems. Um, and scientists have discovered that small aquatic organisms um, ingest these uh, microfibers 
um, and these are then eaten by small fish, which are later eaten by bigger fish. And um, they basically make their way into um, our food chain and ultimately hurting us humans as well, um, or the humans who eat fish, um, as well as the ecosystem. So the impact of fast fashion on microplastics in our oceans is very significant as the quality of clothing decreases under fast fashion, the amount of plastic that is littered as it is washed um, also increases. So currently microfibers already account for 85% of human made debris on the earth's shorelines. Okay, and yeah, so, oh yeah, Jamie, do you wanna? Yeah, um, but, you know, these are the main problems, but there is a whole um, host of other issues. Um, quite simply, the best thing that we can do is lower our consumption of clothes. So only buying when something's necessary and when it is necessary, purchasing um, long lasting essential items from secondhand shops or from sustainable brands, paying attention, especially to the materials that we buy. So for example, it's mentioned earlier, looking for a linen as opposed to water intensive cotton or carbon intensive um, synthetic fibers. And the, the way we handle our clothes is also important. So taking good care of them to make sure they last longer and washing only when we have accumulated a full load so as not to um, waste water. Yeah, so I think we've sort of run out of time there. Um... But yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah, uh, thank you guys. Should we'll thank, put on the Thank you so the much for chat. having us. Yeah, thank you so much, Julie and Jamie, for an amazing presentation. And sorry we didn't get to do all of the quizzes, but we hope you enjoyed um, our presentation. So we'll drop the link to Julie and Jamie's um, cahoots in the chat if you'd like to check it out. Um, but yeah, thank you again for tuning in. Thank you so much to all of the Tide Turners for that awesome uh, presentation. I think that you covered so much in that one hour segment. Um, so thank you so much for highlighting all the kind of diverse issues uh, and threats that are facing our oceans, but also a lot of kind of cause and reason for hope.